Hi, this is State Representative Jenna Powell. Thank you guys for joining us today. Um, we are very excited about chatting today about COVID-19 um, and a lot of data and information that also um, kind of falls into play with COVID in our community and our state. Uh, before we kick off, one of the things I just want to give you guys a little bit update on is we are fighting hard in Columbus, the open state of Ohio. Uh, we know a lot of the regulations and orders that are upon families and businesses throughout our community are really hindering and hurting not only businesses, but families throughout our community. Um, but one of the things that we think about as we are working to kind of um, remove a lot of the government overreach is that as a community, we are, we are self-governing people. Um, we need accurate data and information to be able to make informed decisions for our community and for our state. Um, so as I am in Columbus working to reopen the state of Ohio, um, there are policy plan that we did put out just yesterday, as well as how we um, worked hard at some policy that we need to see removed and changed so that we can get back into function. Banner. You guys can check those out on the new section of my website. Um, you can also sign up for our newsletter um, where we have that information as well. Um, so with that being said, as we are working hard in Columbus to remove the regulation to get people to be able to go back to how the world for COVID-19, um, you know, I all want to do everything I can to inform you with accurate and correct information um, so that as you go about your lives and make decisions for your family, um, you can do that in an informed manner. Today, I am excited to have um, Fire Chief Matt Simmons join us today and chat a lot about what he's seeing ground level in Miami County. So I represent Miami County and County in Southern Dark County. And uh, Matt and I have actually known each other now for years. Um, he does a wonderful job for Miami County, for Troy specifically as their Fire Chief. Um, he has a just a huge realm of experience, not only in suicide, addiction, um, but also now we're really digging in, digging into COVID-19 numbers. So Matt, thank you for joining us today and thank, thank, thanks for coming on. Thank you so much, Jenna. Um, you started off saying, man, we're so excited to talk about COVID. It's usually not a topic that I'm super excited to talk about because it is so difficult to you know, really ascertain really what is going on with COVID. And now we're in about month number six. So, um, you know, when, when I'm out and about, we're constantly getting the questions asked about, uh, it's almost like a data overload. It's almost like a statistics overload for people and to, uh, for your average person, they don't know uh, really how to look at the data and make good decisions based upon their own welfare as well, and as well as their family or business. We're getting a lot of, of, of questions and, and input from the local businesses when all this has been going on, when businesses were shut down, uh, when businesses were reopened to, uh, you know, what is their capacity? The, the fire departments weren't initially uh, advised on what that looked like. And so then very quickly, the fire departments reached out and said, listen, you know, the occupant loads are driven by the fire codes and we were involved. So, um, you know, just, just lots of different people asking us lots of different questions and uh, it's not being publicized. So, you know, a little disclaimer for me, you know, I've been in the Miami County area my whole life. Um, I, I started out born and raised in Piqua, which gets me a lot of uh, grief sometimes here in Troy. Uh, my wife was from Troy and she, so I'm a, I'm a transplant, but I've actually lived in Troy now longer than I, I have anywhere else. But uh, out of high school, I went into the military. I went into the Navy and I was a, attached to a combat unit in the Navy for four years, um, knowing that I want to become a firefighter afterwards. I've always, um, I'm a third generation veteran. And so that was near and dear to my heart as I left high school. I wanted to serve my country in that role. Uh, afterwards, I wanted to continue to serve. It was just, uh, you know, my father has been a public servant pretty much his whole life. Um, you know, it was being a public servant, and being a leader in our churches. Uh, so I'm still providing that role. I've now been at the Troy Fire Department for 20, going over 20 years now, uh, five of which I've been the chief. And it's, it's just, it's been an awesome experience. Um, you know what they say, you know, some people say, if you find a job, job you love, you'll never work a day in your life. And that's, that's really been my experience here at Troy Fire Department. And that's not just based on me and what I do every day. It's the people that I work with. Uh, it's the community in which I serve, um, you know, and that's where, you know, through this crisis since uh, 
uh, February, March. It's It's been unique because I watched a group of men here that I work with at the fire department really just gain more strength. The morale is, is higher at our organization than it's been in several years. And that was pretty true to me in the military too. And some of the situations that we were in that were the most dire, that's when we grew the, the strongest. And I hope that's what our nation can do uh, through these times. And, I, and, I, and it always starts individually in people's homes. And that's where I think today is crucial for people watching this, that they can get a different message today. One with, with, with unbiased facts. And so, and that's very hard to do nowadays. And I, I, we were talking a little bit earlier before we started, but I was telling you about in 1776, George Washington wrote uh, Alexander Hamilton at the time. There was, a, there was a contentious election happening there too. And it was the first election after George Washington gave his farewell address. And so he wrote Hamilton and he says, you know, I firmly believe that the United States, the citizens will act well if they're well informed. But then he went on very shortly thereafter and said, but my only concern is that the people in the political passions will not allow them to have the information. And so, you know, that leads us to today. We want to get to some of these numbers for my community and also for your constituents out there and in the rest of the area that are you know, indicative of what's really going on here. And so, you know, and that's what is, in, in my opinion, uh, what has happened is the people haven't been able to be well-informed. Um, and so I, I get that. And in the beginning, we didn't know what we didn't know, right? So the, you know, when this COVID thing first broke out, uh, some of the, the data and some of the things they were getting from China and elsewhere where it was already really affecting them, it looked dire, it really did. And I'll be the first to say that, you know, we weren't fearful here at the fire department, but we knew that we were in for something that we hadn't experienced before. And so, and, and even the general public in which, you know, I reside in Troy, they were also, everybody was ready to, you know, basically buckle up their bootstraps and say, okay, what do we need to do to protect one another? And that was amazing to watch in action, you know, where small businesses were really just, you know, shut down. Uh, people were, you know, sent to their homes and, uh, you know, your central workers were declared and those people had to continue to work and, and, and doing so without any information, nothing. And then all of a sudden, you know, you started to get a little data of, of all the deaths. Uh, you started to get a little information of all the people in the hospitals being hospitalized for uh, COVID, being on ventilators and such. And so then also what type of PPE do we have for the first responders, hospital staff, those people that are going to be taking care of these people to protect them to do their job. And that was the basis for this COVID crisis. And so that's where we were all at and everybody was on board. But now we fast forward six months into this. We are starting. Is it okay? Yeah, go ahead. Real quick, I think that this is a really important point for our community to remember. And what you said is 100% accurate. At the beginning of COVID-19, we did not know what it was going to entail. And so something to remember very clearly is that our community stepped up and was willing to serve. You know, we were willing to say, you know what, we don't know what this is going to look like, but because we want to care for the most vulnerable among us, we are willing to make the sacrifices um, until we have more accurate data. So I think that's something to keep in mind during this conversation is that our community has stepped up in, in incredible ways. We were willing to sacrifice so much when we didn't know the correct data. Um, but you can keep continuing. I just want to make sure people understand that that's, conversation. It is so true. And, and it was so amazing to watch. I mean, because people's lives, you know, overnight were just radically changed. Uh, schools were, you know, on spring break and then they weren't, you know, the information was 15 days and then, you know, kind of stretching that along to where they didn't go back. There was not a lot of closure for the students. And so that leads me to where, you know, what what is going on now is we do have information. Mm -hmm. There is information at our hands, but now, you know, back to where when even George Washington was talking to Hamilton is, you know, when you get political interest in there, what is the information that the general public is going to have? And so fast forward, I'll, I'll, I just want to lead off with some of our own statistics here in Troy Fire Department, because, you know, it's it's sad to me that 
you know, there's a lot of executive power being yielded in the state of Ohio. And there is a legislative process, which you're part of, and you've been a, an outspoken voice in that. So, you know, the le I've been to Columbus. I have been a, an expert testimony when there has been laws on the books, Senate bills on the floor, House bills getting ready to be uh, discussed, committees that were held to discuss laws that needed to be in place for the general public. Uh, that process, after talking with you and a lot of the other legislators, has really been put on hold when it comes to the COVID crisis. You know, you go to the state's website, it's executive order after executive order after executive order. You can't even keep track of the executive orders. So, but here locally, I, I wanna get into to the statistics and then from there we can talk about some other things, is the Troy Fire Department, you know, we didn't know in the beginning. You know, I went out there and we had to make sure that we did have enough PPE for our people to respond to protect the community. We, um, you know, fortunately for Troy Fire Department, we're hoarders, and we had some PPE that was there from the H1N1 crisis in 2009 that gave us a good jump start on PPE. Uh, we in Troy Fire Department have never had an issue with PPE. I think the state has done a, a good job of making sure of that through the crisis, of making sure others who are less fortunate than we are. And so there has been a good ample supply. There still is. Uh, so just to let you know, for us, we've only experienced eight positive cases out of almost 2,300 patients. That's astounding wow. to me. Um, it's astounding in a fact that, you know, a lot of these cases in Miami County came from the long care term facilities. And so we know that that's a, a data point across the country that is very readily available. And if you decipher through enough data, you can get to that's been the population that has been the most um, affected to where their health is of concern. A lot of comorbidities for those individuals in their nursing homes. Uh, that's primarily the reason they're there is because they're su suffering from some sort of comorbidities. Um, so in Miami County, initially, we had two nursing homes that were severely affected by this. We actually, the Troy Fire Department made one of the calls for, unfortunately, for one of the victims that was the first death in Miami County. It's sad. All lives matter. Uh, these, these individuals who, who have the comorbidities who are of age over 80 years old are very susceptible to this. But on the flip side, there were also a lot of individuals in the nursing homes who got COVID who did not have any symptoms. That's positive. And that's the message I think that needs to be, you know, be put out there is there not everybody is dying from this. And also not everybody who gets this are actually going to be symptomatic. And so to me, when we started looking at the data, now that we're six months into this, I look and I see eight patients, which is less than a half a percent of what we do at Detroit Fire Department. And trust me, we get a lot of people that call us for, for minor things, but we also go out there for the people who need us in the worst day of their lives. And so eight out of 2,600, almost 2,700 patients is not a lot. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, those eight, I don't know, we had that discussion earlier, how many of those were actually, and that's the discussion I think that needs to happen nowadays too, is when they are reporting the deaths, because they are in a Detroit newspaper on the front page, the Miami County Health Department, when they say somebody died that had COVID, did they die from COVID or did they die with COVID? Because I also know dealing with uh, some of my peers in the fire service, uh, in Southwest Ohio, there was a fire department that had eight firefighters who had COVID. One had symptoms, the other seven were asymptomatic. Uh, the one that had the symptoms was minor. He was able to ride that out at home. But they, uh, on their return to work, they wanted to try to get a negative test. And this was back in the early part of June. So they went and they all got tested again, a PCR test. So they were testing for the, the virus itself. Uh, and they all tested positive. 72 hours went by. They wanted to make sure they, they uh, consulted with the health department. They said, yeah, I've tried one more test. They tried again, and then they were all positive again. And so they, they reached out to some higher up in the health department within the state of Ohio. And they said, you do realize that these people who had the virus, even if they were asymptomatic, could test positive on a PCR test for up to 120 days. So that brings us to the point of they ended up not doing any more tests. 
they sent them back to work because now they were symptom free for more than 72 hours. And so they did send them those firefighters back to work. But my point being is when we're reading these stats of people and COVID and, and what's driving the, the governor's uh, charts of the alert indications is positive test. They don't know, like when we read it in a newspaper, you and I don't know, are these people, are they with symptoms? Are they asymptomatic? And are the people in the hospital that are now being hospitalized for as a COVID patient, that is one of the markers that the governor is looking at, or are they just there for a gallbladder? Because mm -hmm. when I've asked these questions to our local hospitals here, they say they can't really ascertain. And when they have somebody with, when we take a patient in with chest pain, this patient will go into there, they will test them appropriately so, but they could be asymptomatic with COVID being treated for another thing, but it's still going down as a hospitalization for COVID. Unfortunately, our government, when they put out the, the $9 billion in the, the, uh, the money, it is incentivizing the hospitals to code their patients that way. I'm not faulting the hospitals, uh, but I wish that Matt, when more- can, go ahead. can you speak to that just a little bit of the incentive being incentivized um, to receive more money for COVID patients? I'm not sure most people, and you don't have to get into depth, but kind of explain what that means for our viewers. Yeah, well, um, well, what happened, and it's a, an unintended consequence of the initial orders when we shut everything down. When they shut everything down, what they did was they shut down general surgeries as well. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, only the, the procedures that are really, you know, life-threatening procedures, the essential procedures can carry on. And so uh, that is a big, big bulk of what the hospitals, how they can sustain their businesses is general surgery. Uh, and when they took that away immediately, uh, I know our own hospital systems, the two in this area are Kettering and Premier, they started to furlough employees. Uh, their, their amount of patient loads went immediately down. And so they lost, I don't even know, I mean, it would be out of my realm to, to, to uh, advise on how much they had lost. But I do know talking to those hospitals, they lost a, a, a great deal of revenue for, to, for them to sustain their, their hospital business. So, and rightfully so, the government, you know, wanted to help them out because they're the ones that shut them down. Uh, but the way the system works is if you have a COVID type patient, you get, it was roughly over uh, $1,200, $1,300 for anybody that would be coded COVID. Uh, and then when they would put them on a ventilator, it would be upwards to 30000 per patient that they could get out of the, uh, the bailout money. Uh, so that is still going on today that they're still getting incentives for patients who have COVID and those who, you know, need to be in an ICU for COVID. So um, it's unfortunate that sometimes our, we're, we, and it's not the fault of the hospitals to do this. It's within the systems that they have, but it's unfortunate. Uh, but back to the point of the data that our general public needs to see and hear is, are the people that are being positive, how sick are they? Are our hospitals filling up? and our people dying because that's the ones that we need to educate the people on you know those people who are at risk because the studies that i have seen and the data that i have seen school-aged children are not at risk as far as becoming very ill in high school and or elementary schools jenna i think i lost you but i can continue on So to the Troy Fire Department, some of talking about the unintended consequences of the what the state has done and you know our COVID, I said, you know, is less than a half a percent of what we do. One of the alarming things that we've been tracking is the overdoses and our suicide type calls because we have seen a rise in that. You know, and when we're sitting around talking coffee in the morning, we our guys are talking and they're like, man, it seems like overdoses are are shooting up. And uh, we started to run the numbers and it's astounding to me uh, looking at year to date numbers and how how far the overdoses have went up. Um, we're, are you back? You're back. We're back. So, so sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. No, you're I fine. I was sharing with 
when we're looking at some of the other unintended consequences and what are we risking for reward, risk and reward, uh, you know, when we're basing decisions made upon, you know, that's what I do every day. Um, that's what our, you know, people who have a small business, you know, if they want to invest in anything in something, what's the reward of investing and what am I going to lose if I invest? Because most likely that money's got to, when it's coming here, it's going away from something else. So uh, when we started to look at our data here locally, you know, we worked really hard on when we were going through the opioid epidemic. Uh, when we found out that we were, you know, and the governor ran his platform on, on combating the opioid epidemic. And in 2014, we started to see 2014, 15, 16, and 17, it was, it was ravishing our community. Uh, the overdoses, we were seeing people in the parks. We were seeing people, you know, parents having their children in tents in their backyard because they love them, but they don't trust them in their home. And here locally, we started, you know, at the advisement of, of me and our police chief to our mayor, we're advisors. They are the ones that the decision makers that said, yes, we need to take extra steps to combat this heroin epidemic. And so we started a quick response team to follow up with those overdoses weekly. Uh, we would go out every week and follow up with every overdose. And it was very successful. And it's sad to me that when I'm running the numbers this year, that we're seeing one of the largest increase in overdoses that we've seen since the peak of this ep epidemic. In 2017, we hit our peak with almost, it was more than an overdose, uh, about two to three overdoses per week. For us, that was a lot. And we're on track currently, Jenna, to hit those numbers once again. Last year in 2019 was our lowest year that we've had. And we attribute that to the community. Uh, our community came out, with mm -hmm. extra strength. We did a Hope Over Heroin event at our Miami County Fairgrounds one year. We did one the next year in Pequa Community Park. Uh, mm -hmm. Churches rose to help out. We had four, over 40 churches in our Miami County that were committed to the efforts that we were doing as, a, as government, as the fire department, police department. And we really started to put a, a dent in the overdoses. We partnered with Miami County Recovery Council and they were able to get different uh, services that they didn't have before with that community support. And so going from one of the least amount of overdoses that we've had in a year of 2019, now to go into 2020, to be up where we were at our peak is sad to me. It is very yeah. sad. And Matt, I just want to jump in real quick and explain to, you know, people listening and watching that, you know, we're giving you this information and data, which we'll go into more about, you know, opioids and suicide and mental illness um, is not to scare our community. But, but to be able to say, look, when you're making decisions about COVID-19 for you and your family, whether that mean not, you know, being on, that mean being on employment. Whether that means you know not going to church and doing it online, whether that means not going to the grocery store, whether that means not being in community with your neighbors, um, you know I've said very clearly we have the ability to do all of these things in a safe manner, um, but we have to keep in mind that there are long-term repercussions um, from living in fear from inaccurate data due to COVID-19. You know we even see, and we'll get into this a little bit, but we even see what's happening with our children in schools. You know, since when did we sacrifice our children um, for inaccurate data and on the altar of politics? You know, right. our children are suffering greatly in our community. And, you know, there's a lot of people that because of inaccurate data, even they're too scared to walk outside of the home. You know, in our community, if you're under the age of 50, not one person has died from COVID. And keep in mind, there is every incentive that when someone dies to market a COVID death because hospitals and things like that are receiving more money. So, so when, you know, there are a lot of repercussions um, for living in fear like many people are, unfortunately. Um, and that's why when we talk about these, these overdose numbers, these um, suicide numbers, you know, it's not to scare people, but it's to give people knowledge that says there is more to your decision making than just looking at COVID alone. There's a lot of short term and long term repercussions on individuals. And that's not even talking just from an not even from an economic standpoint, which one day on this show, we will get into that as well. But probably in the next three to five years, long term economic repercussions from COVID-19. So thank you, though. You can head back in and maybe have yeah. some more on opioid and suicide. And this is why this is important. Yeah, you mentioned suicides. And that's one of the ones that, you know, we've been having them. And it's like back to when we started having the opioid epidemic. 
it was, you know, we realized it, but until we dove into the data, we didn't realize the level of the problem. And so we based our decisions based upon data. We just, it wasn't just anecdotal information. And so our suicides, when we dove into it this past week, we started looking at that as well, because when the CDC director came out last week and he says, you know what, we've got to get these kids back into school. And we're seeing an alarming rate of increases in overdoses and in suicide amongst high school age children. And so we looked at our own numbers, Jenna, from this year where we were last year to where we are now in this year, we're up 267 percent. Wow. 267 percent increase on suicide type calls for the Troy Fire Department from this time this year to where we were at this time last year. Wow. And so that's in 22 people versus six of 2019. That's 22. That's almost every other week we're going out on a suicide type call. And those aren't even the, there are times when people are unfortunately successful at suicide mm -hmm. that we don't even get the call because it's obvious. And so this is just the people that the Troy Fire Department has went out on. And just so you know, people understand, this is 267% increase. Like this is probably only, you know, the beginning. This is really only the beginning of, I think, what we're going to be continue seeing. Um, and the reason I really like that you're talking on this is because, you know, even in our office alone, we have calls about suicide. We have calls about people losing their homes. We have calls about depression. Um, and quite frankly, if people are calling a state rep's office um, about that specific issue, they're in a really bad place. And I don't think people in our community are understanding the depths of pain that are happening in families' lives. And so, you know, to point again, like there is more to your decisions of not choosing, not going to church, more to your decisions of not going out in the community than just faulty COVID-19 data. Um, this is why we need to be self-governing people that understand what's happening and understand our decisions aren't just for us. They make it, they make a huge impact in our community as a whole. You know, even talking to businesses, there's a lot of businesses that can't even expand like they're wanting to because they can't get the workers that they need to. Because a lot of people are still receiving the federal and state unemployment dollars. Um, and this has long lasting impacts as well. And, you know, obviously suicide is a little bit different than, you know, economic strain. But as a community, all these things go hand in hand, economic strain, suicide, mental strain, strain on children, you know, do domestic abuse. Um, you know, they all do go hand in hand to create a striving and, and um, like strong community. So um, one, of, one of the things as as a legislator that you are, um, you know, we talked a little bit in the beginning of in the beginning. We didn't know what we didn't know. But now we're six months into this, Jenna. And when we were looking at the opioid crisis and now that we need to look at some other behavioral mental health issues, you, in order for you legislators and, and for laws and, and even in my own context of where I am at the fire department with, with our former government here to, where I have a mayor that, I, that oversees what I do, we still mm -hmm. advise and different things mostly have to come from council as legislation. I just can't yield my stick as a fire chief and say, we're going to do this to the community. It's based upon a process. And so, but my point there is that we should be able to compare data of where we're at now from where we were a year ago, from where we were five years ago, from the, the Columbus dispatch in the beginning of June did a report on where we at uh, statewide on deaths. Are we higher than a five-year average? Are we lower than a five-year average? And the data was pretty astounding because we're almost flat. We're almost no increase in deaths currently in the state of Ohio versus the five-year trend. I think it was like just barely a 1% increase, but that is that age group that we were talking about earlier, the vulnerable age group. But my question here locally, and it still has yet to be answered, is in Miami County, our deaths, 80% of those have come from long care facilities. You know, I, I don't want to sound callous in this conversation because I do care about those people. I care about people in a nursing home. I have both of my, two of my grandparents out of the four ended up dying from out of a nursing home. And so I visited them. I understand that. But it has yet to be anybody to tell me 31 out of our 39 deaths have come from the nursing homes. I ask our local health department, how many people die on average in our nursing homes? I don't need names. Give me aggregate data so I can have something to compare to. And our general public can have something to compare to. 
because is is the a the amount of people that have died in our long care facilities is there is like our suicides is a 267 percent increase mm -hmm. but if you don't give us that information how are we to act how are we to live our lives and it's like that information is available i wish we could get that information because then we can see is this any different where we're at this year now that we're six months into this than any other year Mm -hmm. I, I would question. I mean, and nobody will give me those those data points, but um, I would if if I were guessing and, you know, in my opinion, from the data I can ascertain from the CDC's website and others is there is an age group that there is a slight increase this year in deaths, but for everybody else, it's lowered. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's, you know what? we should be able to use comparable data at this point for the American citizens, our community to make decisions on what's best for them. Is it best for me to still continue to go to my church and worship that is one of my inalienable rights? Or is it the governor gonna tell me that I can't? Yeah, Matt, I think that's a really good point. And I, I, you know, I think it's always a hard discussion about the age demographic um, because instantaneously the other side is gonna say, you know, uh, you hate old people. You know, we, we know that's what they're going to say because they've already said it. Um, we both know that's just not true. Um, we both know that we want to care for the most vulnerable among us um, and be able to do that in a smart, informed way. But one of the things that's really interesting to me is I sit on the Aging and Long-Term Care Committee on the Ohio House. I as well am on the governor's board for um, dementia and aging, um, you know, demographic in our state. So I do have a good amount of um, kind of insight on the aging demographic as well as I receive many calls from nursing care facilities, long-term care facilities. And, you know, this whole narrative is spun up in fear. You know, it's fear that if you walk outside and you're 20 years old, you're going to die. Well, that's just not factual when, we, when you look at the information. Um, there's literally almost 0% chance that that's actually going to happen to you. You know, but additionally, they're painting this picture as if, you know, all the older people want to stay locked into these long-term care facilities that they don't want to see their grandchild, that they don't want because they're afraid of getting COVID. Um, while maybe that's the case for some, I've received so many calls to both my office, my cell phone, my email of literally older people saying, Jenna, we want to be freed. Like we can't stand living our lives like this. We would rather go out and about and make decisions for ourselves rather than be locked in this place and die alone. And so these are, you know, things we also have to keep in mind and more calls than not, that's actually what I'm receiving. And what's really interesting about that is, is to your point, Matt, that we as individuals have to make um, informed decisions. You know, we have to make smart decisions for ourselves, for our family, and for our community. And what we're seeing now is just gigantic overreach from the executive branch in the state of Ohio. You know, that's what I always ask people when they say, well, is it overreach or not? The question to ask yourself is how long can a pandemic continue that the executive branch can continue extending orders? Just today, an order was extended till end of the year. So end of 2020, you know, how long can they do that? How long can they use that revised code to say, I'm using the pandemic powers to, in my opinion, legislate instead of allowing the legislature to have discussion in committees um, and in session. And that's why I've been a, a big push to say, look, look, I do not believe the executive branch can do what they're doing. If we want to continue orders, then that needs to happen through the legislative branch of the House and the Senate. There needs to be debate back and forth between both branches, between the House and the Senate, so that we can make informed decisions for our community and our state, so that all areas can be represented. Because no one knows Miami County and Dark County better than myself and our state senator. You know, the governor doesn't. The governor's not here every day talking to the nursing care facilities. And quite frankly, that's not his job. He has a different job in the executive branch. And so, you know, as a leader, the leader of the state of Ohio should want the legislative branch to be able uh, to be able to either back him and say, yes, what you're doing is correct, or no, through discussion and debate, what you're doing is not correct. And we do not 
and we're not going to allow this to happen. Um, and I think that's really important for individuals, which is why informing our community of what's really going on with the data and information. So that as I'm fighting in Columbus and trying to open the state of Ohio and remove the COVID-19 regulations, so that when that happens, people aren't uh, just blissfully walking around and not understanding the information so that they can make informed decisions for themselves and their family and say, you know, is the benefit of staying in from COVID outweighing the negatives of, of suicide, of depression, of domestic violence, um, not only to them, but also their church community, their, their community as a whole, the kids down the street. And I think that's really important in this conversation. I, I know we're almost out of time, but I do want to hit just real fast, if it's okay, real briefly on asymptomatic spread. Um, because we're seeing now more and more people who are very low symptoms to having no symptoms at all. And it's, it's kind of pushing this, this whole mask deal that is, is getting haywire. But, you know, as a fire chief, that was very alarming to me because, you know, my first responsibility as a fire chief is to the personnel that I have that go out and protect our community. And so, you know, back to what you're saying is like individuals, you know, you really, it's up to you. It should be up to you. And me as a fire chief, I wasn't going to rely on state information, CDC, you know, because there is so much misinformation and they're, you know, at one, in one breath, Dr. Fauci in, in March 20th is saying, hey, absolutely. It makes no sense for anybody who aren't healthcare providers to be wearing masks or the people who aren't sick. And now fast forward. So it's like I did my own research on asymptomatic spread because I was finding out through the fire service around the country, most of the firefighters are healthy. So most of the firefighters who were testing positive were very minor symptoms to asymptomatic. That being said, they still had to leave work. And then the concern is, well, now that I have this, am I going to spread this to my family? Which is a valid concern for our people because, you know, it's one thing to protect our community, but then we're going to send them home to, to their families. So there was a Dr. Gregory, Gregory Chiklis that I found information on out of Boston, who's a research scientist. He has a lab that is currently... Uh, collecting convalescent plasma that has the antibodies in it to treat people, which is great. There, there are people who are being treated with that plasma and the antibodies, which is great treatment. That's being heard around the country. But what he did was he did a massive study on first responders, police officers, firefighters, EMS, and those people who were sent home asymptomatic, and he tested their family members a week, two weeks out, three weeks out, and a month out. Not one time out of several hundred did he find where an asymptomatic first responder passed that to their family members. So that's the information that, that as a general public, research it. And if you can't research it, find those people who have it. Because when I relayed that to my personnel, that it gave them hope. It gave them that, hey, I'm not going to take something and get at the fire department serving my community and go home and kill my family. Uh, so... And but they didn't have the access and nor do they have time all day to research or out making calls. But I do. And so and that's what the WHO said. Asymptomatic yeah. spread is very low and they're having a hard time proving that it is happening. Not that it can't. I'm not saying that it's impossible. But the research that Dr. Chickless did that we connected and we've talked uh, several times since is he's still not finding that he is still seeing in his mind and his research is sick people will transmit this virus. And so that gave our guys here at the fire department a lot of hope. And it's like, just giving, give, then I give them the information and they can make good decisions based upon their family. Now through this whole thing, we've changed knowing what we know. We have do, we do clean up here at the fire department like we never have. We, we, every time we go out on a patient, we do a good decontamination of our equipment. And we also wash our laundry here. We don't have our guys take their laundry home but we're still not living in fear because we have good information to base our decisions. And you said it exactly right. You know, choosing to just live you know, uninformed is not a good way of living. Like we make smart decisions. All of us probably wash our hands more. You know, if we're feeling any ill, we're probably not going out as much. And so we're not asking people to live just uh, blissfully unaware. We're saying with the information that you have, let's live um, with wisdom, prudence to protect the most vulnerable among us. And, you know, what you're doing at the um, station is doing just that. Um, I, I do have two quick questions for you because I know we didn't get a hit on this too much. Um, the one is a little bit about, and I always mispronounce, mispronounce the drug name, but hydro, thank you. Um, 
Thank you. Exactly. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about that. I know we have discussion and then also we're going to talk very briefly about the statewide mask mandate, especially for children in schools. So if okay. you want to hit on things just yeah, a little bit. I mean, a, a couple of weeks ago in this uh, research scientist, Dr. Chiklis, people can look him up or they can contact me if they want to get more information. Uh, he is one of the ones as well as 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 there are many physicians. And here's you know, real brief, I'll just say that it's it's unfortunate that the executive yielding power that we're seeing in the state of Ohio is on a on one side of, of ad advisement, meaning it's only coming from the the director of the health department. It's unfortunate there's not a, a counter to the advisement of, okay, hey, here, governor, here's what the health department's saying. Here's what some other well-known physicians are countering that argument of saying this. And hydroxychloroquine is a, is a prime example. The pharmacy board came out and said, hey, the FDA said it's not, uh, you know, there's no, you know, research benefit currently that, that says it's great for treating COVID when we knew there was a lot of the doctors around the country, not, and, and it's well documented that patients were, were uh, being treated with hydroxychloroquine, a Z pack, and zinc, and immediately the benefits, and they weren't even having to be hospitalized for that. And so the issue there is, you know, we still live in hopefully in a form of government that when our founding fathers set it up and established it in a limited form, a limited form. Uh, Frederick Bastiat said, he said, you know what, we have no more room to thank our government for when we're successful than we do to blame them when we're unsuccessful. And so, you know, in health, should we be thanking the government when we're healthy? And should we be blaming them when we're unhealthy? I don't think so. I think that each one of us has an individual responsibility, but back to the hydroxychloroquine, that's between a patient and their physician. If there, there is a medicine that is out there, you know, unfortunately, my mother passed away of cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when she did, I remember the family at our urging, we urged her one last time to, to look and get a second opinion. And so she went to the James Center at Ohio State University, and she didn't really want to. She wanted to just kind of, you know, say, hey, I've tried everything that I could. But we urged her because we're like, is there something new? Is there something different? Is there a medicine in trials? Is there something that that our mother can take that can help her and maybe save her life? Ultimately, she passed away. Uh, but that was that was something that is out there as Americans that we should have the right to do. We shouldn't have the government stepping in and say, no, nope, we're just going to immediately stop this. And that's the misinformation. That's the the paradox of where our state, currently the state of Ohio, one minute this is going on, and you never know when the next shoe is going to drop that is going to change our lives drastically. I don't know. I, I totally believe that if I had a family member that had COVID and they were very ill, I would want them to try everything that I heard that is working. Yeah. That should, no, be, their, that should be their right. So, yeah, no. and so no. that's the thing with hydroxychloroquine. I know there is a lot of research that is saying it's working and in short doses, there are no side effects for short periods of time. Uh, so that's, that's where I'm at with hydroxychloroquine or any other treatments, the plasma treatments that there hasn't been a bunch of research and studies that say the, the covalescent antibodies of COVID treating people is going to, you know, the FDA hasn't had time to say that that's an approved treatment. But what is going on is four treatments of 200 cc's is reversing the, the side effects and the symptoms of people that were very, very sick. And that's great because that's the message of hope. There are treatments out there that even for the sickest of sick, that between the covalescent plasma treatment of the antibodies or the hydroxychloroquine and or there's a doctor out of Texas that was saying just a, a nebulized steroid of you know, budesonide is working. And he's had 400 patients that have immediately saw the benefits of that drug. But again, back to there should be certain things as an Americans that we have that right between our doctor and us to choose the treatment for us. Yeah, now, I think that's exactly on. And I appreciate you sharing that. I think right now there's a battle going on. You know, do individuals know best for themselves or does one individual know what's best for you, your grandma and you?
your entire family. And that's something that, you know, I think everyone needs to consider. Um, you know, I know where I stand. I think, you know, everyone knows in my community that I believe that we have personal freedoms and abilities to make choices. Um, that's why America is the most strong, the strongest country in the entire world um, is because we have a form of government, government in place that's better than anywhere else in the entire world. And right now we are fighting to hold on to that and to keep that. Um, so thanks for explaining that. One thing I, oh, sorry, go ahead. So I, will, I want to hit on that mass thing just real fast. And so I'll, I'll, I'll stay in my lane. And my wife has told me, she's like, you need to stay home of expertise. And so we at the fire department, sometimes we've got a little time on our hands. So, you know, I, I am I am one way and everybody that knows me on this mask issue is, you know, there has not been enough research. I'm in currently in a master's program where if I did some of the things that our government in the state of Ohio has done, I would get an F on my on my paper. If I looked at one thing and said, well, I believe this or I believe that, you know, you, you it's like, you know, you have to do your research and there has to be validated studies, scholarly resources that you can do. The last time I checked medical research projects usually are a minimum of two years and that's with empirical data. So real fast, I'll get back to the school age children and wearing these because they're saying that that mask, there is no ill side effects, right? I mean, they're saying, hey, you know, you don't love one another unless you wear a mask because you're telling the other person you don't love them. Well, from my my studies and my research that I've had with professionals on asymptomatic spread, it outweighs the research on people who say there is asymptomatic spread. You can't find one study on the state of Ohio's website. They direct you to the CDC's website. And I researched their studies and there are quite a few studies in there. They got about 16 studies, uh, about five of them you can't research. There's not links. The ones that are, there's another five from Wuhan, China on family members in Wuhan, China. I'm not sure that I would trust that. That's just yeah. me. But I will, I will get back to my point of here. We had a little time on our hands yesterday and we did a, a research. I put an N95 on and we have pulse oximetry to measure how much oxygen in our, our saturation and it's exchanging in our lungs. We also have in tidal CO2, which measures carbon dioxide because that's one of the things that they're saying, hey, you wear a mask, it's not enough to create your oxygen levels to get low. You wear a mask, it's not enough to increase carbon dioxide in, in you to rebreathe that, right? That's what they're saying. So we did an experiment just for a half hour. It's not by no means like something I'm going to publish. I can't. But it was just a half hour, me and another firefighter sitting at the table, two other paramedics checking our vital signs as we're going along. I started out with a 99% O2 set, which is normal for a healthy individual. By the end of my half hour, I dropped down to 95%. That's not alarming because, you know, for normal adults, it's 95 to 95. 9%. You drop below 95%, it is to the levels of a, of a somebody who suffers from COPD. Okay. Now, the other firefighter who had his on and checking his carbon dioxide, normal carbon dioxide levels are 35 to 45. Okay. You go above 45, it's not good. You're going to start to get into uh, issues with oxygen in your blood, and it's going to become harmful. He started out at 38 at the end of the 30 minutes, just sitting there, no, we're not working or anything, it shot up to 45. So uh -huh. I'm just saying from mm -hmm. my own anecdotal, just quasi research, it makes a difference when you throw these things on healthy people. I can't imagine mm -hmm. school age children trying to wear these things for eight hours, let alone the teachers yeah. to try to enforce that. When we know that's the age and population that is not suffering serious illness, the hospitalizations for those age groups are not there. So then does it come back to full circle what we we're talking about? Educate those people. And if they have family members who are at risk to take precautions there, not in the schools. That's just me as somebody who looked at it and said, you know what? Because when I throw a mask on, Jenna, it does something to me physiological. My blood pressure increased amongst that. My pulse increased during that half hour. And it's like, yeah, it wasn't crazy out of line, but I can't imagine all day what that would look like. Yeah, you know, that's been a, a big push is, you know, just recently he did the statewide mask mandate. Um, last Tuesday, he came out and said all, you know, school age children have to wear a mask in schools. Um, you know, it's been very interesting because the discussion before this was very specifically 
um, you know, hey, we have local school districts, we have local school boards and superintendents and principals and parents uh, for a reason. They can make wise decisions for their kids. Um, you know, one thing as people are watching this, I want to tell you guys is that, you know, the governor came out and said this on his press conference last Tuesday, um, but there's actually nothing signed into order as of yet. So a lot of the schools that have been calling me, they don't they don't even know what the actual order is. And as we've seen from the administration now over the last about five, six months, is that they continue flip flopping. They'll say one thing, they'll do another. He'll say one thing and then the order actually comes out a little bit different. So I know there's uh, members of the Ohio House that are pushing to, I mean, obviously we want to remove the statewide mask mandate, um, but if they're continuing to move forward on it, then we want to make it make it a lot better for children because there's not actually many exemptions that he gave in the press conference either that came out. And we understand that there's a lot of children, whether they're suffering from you know anxiety, whether they're suffering from um, asthma, things like that. I don't think asthma was even a symptom that they cannot wear a mask for, which is actually a little mind boggling to me. Um, so I, and I understand I get a lot of calls from parents that are scared, that are frustrated. Um, we are working for you, you know, in the Ohio House, we're working to remove um, the statewide mask mandate. Um, if that's the way the administration, unfortunately, is going as we're trying to fight the administration, we're trying to say, no, you have to add more exemptions for children um, that are going to public school. Because one thing as well, there's, um, I forget the exact statistic I was looking at this morning of amount of schools that are actually doing all online. What's very interesting to me in the state of Ohio, because we know that a lot of these children, um, the parents are working. And so in our communities, especially rural areas where we have a huge shortage of child care already, well, just logically thinking this through, where are these kids going to stay? They're going to stay at their grandparents' house. And it's so just mind boggling to me that people think this is a good idea with no option for in school, for, for even children that have no place to go. Um, instead, it's like, okay, are you going to send them to grandma that's 85 years old? And it truly is one of the vulnerable demographics in our community. Um, you know, while parents do have a choice, that's why I think educational choice is really important. Um, we have online school, we have brick and mortar school, we have charter schools, we have private schools. These are all important choices for parents um, because we know parents know what's best for their children more than, you know, the governor of the state of Ohio or one director of health that's trying to just move forward on a decision for every child in our state. Um, that's why opening the schools is important. While it might not be the best choice for every child, it is a choice that is needed um, in the day and age that we live in. One, one of the crazy things that you just said something that reminded me of something is you were saying, okay, these students are you know, most likely gonna be with their grandparents. I don't know if even you know this, but about two months ago, a couple months ago, they started talking in Ohio about box it in. This was when Dr. Amy Acton was still you know, mm -hmm. giving the guidance and they were talking about at some point quarantine people, right? They were saying, hey, they're gonna send out postcards and they were going to, you know, if, if you only had one bathroom and you had more than five people living in your household and you had somebody that had the COVID, they were gonna take you to a quarantine location. It blew my mind when I get these emails from the state of Ohio, I get emails every day from, from the Emergency Operations Center, from the, the Ohio Emergency Management Agencies. And there's an interactive map that showed the quarantine locations. They, in Miami County, were gonna quarantine people and, and because, you know, you're going to get flack from this. I'm going to get flack that we don't care for certain demographics of people. We do. But the quarantine location in Miami County was the nursing homes. Hmm. They were going to wow. take people with COVID to some of these nursing homes who hadn't had an outbreak. They hadn't had a positive case. And they were wow. going to put them in a nursing home. That's and, great. and so that's the information. It's like, you know, people like myself and you, you hear these the wow in one message they're saying oh we care and we're going to do this and we're going to do all these things that are good for the public and then they do that they ban hydroxychloroquine and it's like so this is you know the message to your listeners the message to our communities is like listen for every action that we take and that the every action that especially the government takes that's not just you know the law of physics that there's an equal re you know opposite reaction usually it's more and, you know, I, I will end with kind of where we started was, unfortunately for our small community, Troy, shutting down our businesses, shutting down, you know, the different things and now threatening school is we only saw eight patients here at Troy Fire Department, eight out of 27, 2,300. But we've seen our overdoses increase 176%. And we've seen suicides increase 267%. Wow. So you can't, and, and this is in my opinion, 
treat Troy like you treat Columbus and Cincinnati, where there are potentially people living in a lot closer proximity in apartment buildings or large apartment buildings. You can't treat us the same. Give us the data. Tell us who has COVID, who died of it versus with it. Tell us who's being hospitalized because of COVID, not just with it. And let us make decisions that are best for our community and our kids. Matt, that is exactly right. Thank you for informing our community so well today. Um, I know people are very blessed by your information and by the work that you do and the service you, you've given our community for so many years. Um, so thank you for that. Um, you know, as we go our days and weeks moving forward, one thing I just um, kind of, as Matt mentioned, to encourage our community is that we do not live in fear. You know, we are Americans. We are individuals who, who love our community and that when inaccurate data and the fear mongering is happening in, in the media, you know, we can look and we can say, you know what? We're not gonna live in fear. We're gonna make smart decisions for us, for our family, for our community. We're gonna try to give back in the best possible way because we know people are hurting in our community. And you know, while we are doing that, I have the ability and the pleasure of, of, of fighting for you guys and being your voice in Columbus and knowing that you know our community believes these things. We believe we can make informed and smart decisions. We are constitutionalists that actually read the constitution and understand the form of government. And so, you know, we really appreciate you, Matt. Thank you for all you do. If you guys get a chance that are watching, um, send, send Matt an email. Matt, if people have questions on, you know, how they might be able to help with, um, you know, people that are suffering from suicide or would there be a contact or something like that that they might be able to email? Absolutely, they can uh, contact us here at Detroit Fire Department. They can call 911 and, uh, you know, but our, our working number here at Detroit Fire Department is 937-339-3140. Uh, the easiest way is to find us on the website at, at troyohio.gov. You can link and find us. We have resources on there. We talk about our quick response team. And I just wanna end by saying that, man, Troy is an amazing community. I, I tell my wife, we are so blessed to live in small America because of, of the support for one another. Uh, Jenna, we had people giving us their stimulus checks because they thought we were just facing so, so wow. much like with the COVID and we tried to give it back, but they wouldn't take it. So, so I, I say mm -hmm. that, you know, for those people that are thinking about that, we appreciate the gesture, but find a good nonprofit. Uh, but, you know, man, I, I wake up every day, so blessed to work in the community that I live in. Uh, but I'm also going to speak up when I, I see things happening that that are just not true. And also, you know, to prevent in the future more harmful unintended consequences that if we don't stop this, it's going to get worse. Well, Matt, thank you so much. Thank you for your service. For those who are watching, I will also link Matt's information below in the um, Troy Fire Station. As well, if you have questions, you can email our office at any time and have your voice heard. You can email rep. It's rep80 at ohiohouse.gov. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we appreciate your time.